Thank you very much, Mike. Please do keep that passage open, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are another generation who has risen and will fall, and yet we praise you that your word is living and sure. We pray that it might do your work in us this morning, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. During Hurricane Irma, we were in contact with some friends who live in Miami, and they were sending us WhatsApp messages as the storm made landfall, and it was, you could sense their fear through the messages that they sent. One of the messages said this, the storm seems to be turning north, which is bad for us. Please pray it will go out to sea. As you know, Irma did prove to be lethally dangerous, 73 killed in Florida State. And here we have another storm in Mark 4, another frightening situation. And just like those WhatsApp messages from Miami, there is something which connects all of us to this storm, I think, and that is the fear of the disciples. As the waves smash over the boat, they cry out, don't they? Teacher, don't you care that we're drowning? Or as another translation puts it, probably better actually, teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? They're facing these hostile forces outside of their control. Looks like they're going to perish. And it feels like, well, Jesus doesn't really care. So a storm on a Middle Eastern lake, but actually very similar fears. Of course, lots of people live with fear, don't they? I I was at Bournemouth Crematorium uh, last month conducting a service of the burial of ashes. Marjorie Leonard, known to some here. And as the funeral director and I stood in the rain waiting for the family to arrive, making conversation, I said to the funeral director, do you get used to death seeing it so often in your job? And quick as a flash, he said, no, I'm absolutely terrified. Went on to explain why. People live with this kind of fear, don't they, of perishing, of a world of forces that they cannot control. It's not really that very far away. Some of us might say, well, look, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I, I don't fear my own death. I'm safe in Christ. And that is gloriously true for many of us. And yet, we might well fear the death of other people. 300,000 people in the Bournemouth area. But how many of them know Christ? How many are set to perish without him? Seems like every headline you read is reminding us of what a chaotic, hostile world it is. And the growth of Jesus' kingdom so that people might not perish, that feels very unlikely, doesn't it? Let me suggest that through this passage, God meets us in our fear, whatever precise flavor of our fear might be, and he moves us towards faith in his son. Two faith-building encouragements this morning. Here's the first, trust Jesus because he is the rescuing Lord of creation the rescuing Lord of creation. Let me read from verse 35 again. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus has been using this boat as a pulpit since the beginning of chapter 4, verse 1. He's been teaching from it, teaching the parables that we've been hearing in the last few weeks. But now the boat is pressed into service as a boat. Uh, It's a means of transport again. They're heading off to the other side of the lake. And just as an aside, if you're here and you're not really that convinced about the Bible and why should we listen to it anyway, it seems that this account has all the, the, the kind of rings, the hallmarks, of authenticity about it. So look at the details we're told. Verse 35, evening came. Verse 36, Jesus was taken just as he was. Uh, There were also other boats with him. As far as I can see, there's no great theological significance to any of those details, but we're told them, and that reminds us that this is an eyewitness account. Probably Peter, in this case, passing on the details as he remembers them to Mark who then wrote them down. Anyway, Mark sets the scene for us. 
It was, verse 37, a furious squall, or a more wooden translation, a storm of great wind. It was a storm of great wind. Have you seen the George Clooney film, Perfect Storm? Huge mountainous waves, little boat tossed around like a cork, uh, people sliding all over the deck, absolutely drenched. Um, that must have been something like what it was like. And if we still think, well, it can't have been that bad, we're given two extra details in verse 37. The waves are breaking over the boat, and the boat was nearly swamped. So I picture these experienced fishermen up to their waist in water, grabbing any bucket they can find to try and bail out the water and keep the boat afloat. In fact, sudden storms like this were not uncommon in Galilee. They're not uncommon today. Uh, the lake is 13 miles long, 8 miles wide, but it's 700 feet below sea level. And it's surrounded by these big hills like the Golan Heights. And that means that the wind funnels and um, blasts through these hills and, and whips up very quickly into storms. So sudden storms are normal in the area. But what is abnormal is the violence of this storm. Experienced fishermen panicking for their lives. Bit of speculation as to how Jesus actually manages to sleep in this storm. Some people argue it must be a sign of his divine omnipotence, his trust in God the Father. I tend to think he's just exhausted, utterly exhausted. He's fully man after all. But however he manages to sleep, well, the disciples are outraged, aren't they? Above the din of the crashing waves as they slip and slide on the deck. We can imagine them shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? It's not respectfully worded as a, quest a question for their admired teacher. This is terror talking, the kind of aggression that comes with desperate panic. It's not actually clear what they think Jesus should have been doing. Do you think they're imagining him grabbing a bucket and helping them bail out? Or do you think they want a bit of the miraculous power that they've seen in what we know as chapters 1 to 3 of Mark's gospel? We don't know. But we do know that the response they got stunned them. Have a look at verse 39. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? It was completely calm, calm enough for paddleboarding, absolutely flat. The kind of calm that you, that you look into the sea and you see your reflection in the water. The kind of calm where you drop in a stone and see the circles moving out as the ripples spread. Mountainous waves as flat as a pancake. Now the skeptic might say, look, wind comes suddenly, Wind can disappear suddenly, but waves don't disappear suddenly, do they? Take days for a storm to die down. And then there's the shock of the disciples. They're terrified. They ask each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Just on the disciples' reaction, the NIV is a wonderful translation of the Bible, but I would, I would love them to have left the word great in the passage it doesn't come up at all, I don't think, in our passage, but actually it's there three times. So let me just show you that. Verse 37, a furious squall, actually a storm of great wind. That'd be a very simple way to translate it. Or verse 39, the end of it, it was completely calm. Actually, a great calm. You could say it like that. Or verse 41, they were terrified, or they had a great fear. Now, that might sound like a pedantic thing to say, but it is interesting. You get great wind, great calm, great fear. First time we're told of the fear of the disciples is not when it looks like they're going to die in the middle of the storm, but when Jesus has brought a great calm. That is more terrifying than the storm in which they found themselves. Great wind, great calm, great fear. Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Of course, Jesus' answers, uh, Jesus' actions really do answer that question, don't they? 
Who is it that can speak to the elements, who can address the wind and the waves like a naughty toddler? Well, we've sung about it in our all-age song earlier on. Only God can do that. Only God can do it. The Bible consistently speaks of God as the only one who's in charge of creation and of the sea as an example of, of chaos, of a force that can only be controlled by the Lord God himself. Now, would you turn to Psalm 107? I want to show that very briefly. Psalm 107, page 611, I think. Psalm 107, I'll read from verse 23. Others went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. We'll flick back to Mark 4. And the parallel is hardly very subtle, is it? Mark surely having this passage in mind as he wrote, the storm with massive waves, men's courage melting away, men crying out to the Lord, the Lord stilling the storm, the waves of the sea hushed. And as Jesus calms the storm, it's as if he's pulling out his passport. And he's saying, look, there really is no doubt over who I am. The miracles of chapters 1 to 3 aren't enough. This is a thing that only God can do. Calming the storm. Reducing the wind and waves to nothing. Yes, Jesus is fully human. He needs to eat. He gets exhausted. But he's also fully God. We're privileged to have as a church each week visitors who wouldn't call themselves Christians. And really, if that's you this morning, you're very, very welcome. But I think that question of verse 41 comes your way. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. It doesn't make sense to dismiss him as a a good moral teacher, a bit like Gandhi. It doesn't make sense to dismiss him as a good man who was overhyped by his followers. Gandhi or good men, they, they don't pull out their passport like this, do they? And show a complete mastery over the created elements. He's the rescuing Lord of creation. You might know that this is actually the first of four miracles in Mark's gospel, and in each one, Jesus will overturn the effects of the fall. In fact, by the fourth miracle, the raising of Jairus' daughter, he'll raise a girl who has perished and raise her back to life. And as we reach the end of Mark's gospel, we see that he saves from death by facing death himself. As he goes to the cross, the creator, yes, but bearing the sin of created beings, standing in the shoes of sinners like us, and facing the judgment we deserve. He is the rescuing Lord of creation. Now, why is all this good news? Well, for all of us, it means that an end to fear is possible. It's possible. Just have a look at verse 40. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? It was the absence of faith, the absence of really knowing who Jesus is and trusting that. That was what led to their panic. The implication as you grow in faith will sow that panic disappears. If the disciples had trusted Jesus properly, they would have had no fear, even in the chaos of the storm, even as Jesus appeared to be sleeping and oblivious. No fear of the chaotic world around them, no fear of perishing. 
if they had faith. Good reminder to those of us who are trusting in Jesus this morning that we're not trusting in a weakling who's kind of unable to help or or a callous king who's unwilling to help. We're trusting in the rescuing Lord of creation. That is who he is. Absolute power. Very good news as we consider our own death. I know the actual process of dying is is a grim one. But we need not fear the outcome. We'll get through it, if I can put it like that. He rescues the perishing. He is the rescuing Lord of creation. But it's also good news as we consider the world outside our window. These headlines which seem so overwhelming. uh, The kingdom advance which seems so tiny and small. Jesus is no weakling. He's the rescuing Lord of creation. Absolutely able to to rescue anyone whom he chooses. Powerful and good and utterly in control. But still, we might ask, there's a bit of a disconnect, isn't there? Okay, he's the rescuing Lord who's rescuing the perishing. But how are these vast hordes of people ever going to be reached in Westbourne, Bournemouth and Poole, your relatives, your friends? Well, we need to hear the second encouragement of the, the episode. Trust in Jesus who rescues by his words. Trust in Jesus who rescues by his words. We've noted what Jesus did, but let's just look briefly at how he did it. Verse 39 again. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. Those two verbs, rebuking and speaking, they're used when Jesus met the evil spirit in the first few chapters. And here he is rebuking and speaking to the elements, to the wind and the waves. Doesn't say very much, just three words as we have it, quiet, be still. But it's enough to bring about absolute calm. Now there are times when Jesus heals with a touch. You might remember him reaching out to the the leper in great compassion. But how thrilling here in Mark 4, having had lots of teaching on the power of Jesus' words, to actually see that power in action. So we've learned about the farmer who sows the word. We've learned that the word will be powerful to grow the kingdom, even though there's lots of wastage, the parable of the soils. We've learned that word will grow the kingdom despite the delay, the parable of the growing seed. We've learned that it will grow the kingdom uh, despite how puny and insignificant it seem, seems, the parable of the mustard seed. And now having been told about the power, we're shown the power. Do you see that link? We've been told about the power, we're shown the power. Our words are not very powerful, are they? Uh, if you watch whichever toddler ha- happens to be having a meltdown through in the hall, Um, observe the parents' words and the power they have. Uh, The words may be very rational, may be uh, quite what the toddler needs to hear, but they'll just bounce off the toddler, won't they, as they sort of rotate with legs kicking on the floor. And that's when we try and talk to another human being. If you went to Bournemouth Pier and started speaking to the the waves below you, well, people would assume that You'd lost your grip on sanity. Jesus' words are different. They are immensely powerful. Hebrews 1 tells us, the Son, that's Jesus, the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, he's sustaining all things by his powerful word. Every atom in your body, every planet in the universe. I don't understand how, but Jesus is sustaining it with his word. Of course, the creation was spoken into being by God, wasn't it? But he's sustaining it, the Lord Jesus, with his word. And here in Mark 4, we see the the raw, naked power of that word. He speaks to the wind, and it responds to him. He speaks to things which cannot hear, and they hear him if I can put it like that. He rescues by his powerful words. 
Now, it's hard to overstate the importance of this truth. So if you've been napping, do uh, bring your nap or your neighbor's nap to an end. Um, we need to learn that God, that the Lord Jesus, he is God and he rescues by his words. I met a pastor a few years ago in Kenya, uh, chatting to him about a mission week that he was involved with. And his plan for the first evening of this mission week was to get the whole team together and to pray for miracles by which he meant physical healing. His thinking was that if the team saw those miracles, they would be really encouraged about the power of God and would then go out to the, the slums around the uh, center and share the gospel really boldly. Now, I don't doubt for a moment his sincerity and his evangelistic zeal would put many of us to shame. But I do propose that it would have been better for him to open Mark 4 as he had the team gathered and to read out this little episode that we have recorded to show people the absolute power of Jesus' words. Power enough to calm a storm. Power enough to rescue the perishing. This is the greatest miracle so far in Mark. It is the high point of Mark's gospel so far, the clearest proof that Jesus is God, and it involves three words. We have God's word preserved for us, the words of Jesus. They are powerful to rescue. Let me say, I've, as I've reflected on this passage and this church family this week, I guess Emily and I have been getting to know you, it's been a great joy over the last year, I just feel encouraged that there is every reason to be sure that Jesus' kingdom will be advancing, both amongst us and beyond us. Not because we're anything special, certainly not because we're getting everything right as a church, but because sinful and flawed as we are, the word is going out. The words of Jesus are being opened, shared, preached, talked about. And so we can have confidence that the Lord Jesus will be building his kingdom as that word goes out. That's not me being kind of glass half full thinking. It's just hard theological fact. Jesus rescues the perishing by his word. Therefore, if you're seeing the word go out, you can be sure that the perishing will be rescued and Jesus' kingdom will be built. It's an encouragement as we think about what's going on upstairs at the moment. All those groups, children and young people, as leaders lead those groups exhausted from the working week, well, in every room there'll be an open Bible or a children's Bible of some sort. The word going out, therefore, be confident that the kingdom is growing. Huge encouragement as we think of the Dobsons taking home that children's Bible and of an evening somewhere between the fish fingers hitting the wall and the tantrums and bath time and bedtime, the word of Jesus being opened, the word going out and the kingdom growing. It's an encouragement as we think about the ministry training evening tomorrow night, the home groups, sorry, the home group leaders gathering feeling weary, discouraged perhaps, but at the heart of the evening, the word open, the kingdom growing as that word is taken out to however many groups, is it 15 home groups? I can't remember. That word being shared. Huge encouragement as we think about Limington. I don't know how many hundreds or thousands you might be able to give, but it might seem like, well, are we really backing a winning horse? Is it really a worthwhile expenditure? Well, it is because the word is going out and will be going out in ever-increasing measure. I don't know who will be appointed as the pastor, but I'm sure that the interview panel will only appoint someone who will want the Bible to be in the driving seat of the local church, such that it's taught and other people are equipped to share it and speak it to one another. We don't judge our we don't judge how well Jesus' kingdom is advancing by the fruit that we can see on any given Sunday morning. We can just say, well, is the word going out? That's how he rescues the perishing. And if we see the word going out, we can be confident that the Lord of creation will be at work. And so may this church be filled with the words of Jesus in an ever-increasing way. Every relationship, every evangelistic venture, 
every regular meeting for believers, that rescuing, kingdom-building word of Jesus, proclaimed, treasured, and shared. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask for your forgiveness for our timidity and our panic in the face of what we can see. We praise you for this reminder of who your Son is, the Lord of creation. We praise you that that is true whatever we face as a church, as a nation, as individuals this week. And we praise you too for this reminder of the power of your word. Please may that, that, that confidence in your work in your word, work itself out very practically this week in the way we approach it and in the way we share it. Amen.